want to do that, or you can give um, online at uh, our website, uh, oddbaptist.com, or at our, we have an app. And so there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on here. Matter of fact, our sound room is coming along, our new one. And so next time you come in, you'll hopefully be able to see that. We also this week, as I mentioned, our pastor's roundtable, we got a new clock on the back wall. Now, for right now, because we're still construction over here, the clock's on this side. So I still have the excuse that I didn't see the time because I'm used to looking over here. You know, I'm a creature of habit. But, but then again, the numbers are like this big. So even an old guy like me can see it. Um, and then also... Don't forget, uh, I think next Sunday, will Pastor Danny and Rebecca be here next Sunday? I think they will be. Um, I, I, I talked to him yesterday. I think, they, I know they'll be on their way at the very least. Um, so I was saying our new assistant pastor, but is he a new assistant pastor or is he an old assistant pastor? Um, I, he's old. I mean, he is actually retiring from the Air Force. I mean, so if he's retiring, I mean, old people retire, right? Um, so... I, if he's listening now, I'm, I'm in trouble. So, any rate, all right. Um, well, we are hoping, into, hoping to expand uh, our, 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 the ministry here over the next several weeks. We're just kind of watching what's happening in our local area, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get some new things open here in the next couple of weeks and, and expand what we're doing, but I appreciate being here. Oh, uh, Rebecca says they'll be here in the afternoon next Sunday, so you, know, you, won't, you won't see their lovely faces uh, next uh, Sunday morning here. But any rate, all righty, all righty. Well, I'm glad that you're here this morning. Everybody glad to be here? Say amen. amen. There you go. It's good. We got people, if you're here watching online, we got people in this section. We got people in this section. We got people in this section. Everybody's, you know, we moved the pews far apart. So, uh, well, at least farther apart, I, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't really, does it feel different to y'all? Do you like having all that leg room, Mike Jones? Is it nice having that? Do you? Yeah, I was going to say, we should get those little footstools or something that you could just kick out the <laughs> Mike put it on a few before and his wife had none of that you know so missionaries that's what that happens so all right this morning I want you to uh, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Joshua chapter number seven this morning for our our time in God's word Pastor Cody's already prayed and blessed our our uh, our meal together around God's word and so we're going to go right into it Joshua chapter number seven and for Memorial Day I've entitled this morning's message war Life or death, war, life or death. And I got to tell you, um, I think all of us to some degree take, take for granted the freedoms that we have. And right now, as I preached last week, you know, our freedoms are, we're, we're at a very tenuous time as a, uh, as a nation. And I think one of the things, as I mentioned last week, our founders and what they put on the line to, 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 to pay at great cost to freedom and liberty. So uh, today we are, uh, there's, there's a war going on in terms of our, uh, the freedom and liberties that, that we have. And it also is a time for us to remember those who paid a price for us to continue to have them. And so we're going to look at that t- uh, this morning. And in Joshua chapter number seven, we find uh, the context here. Let me get you up to speed of what's going on into this book of the Bible that Moses, the great lawgiver, the great deliverer, has led the people out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery, and has led them all the way uh, through the wilderness wandering time. And now they're about ready to go finally into the promised land. Uh, God removes Moses off the scene, and uh, God l- brings Joshua on as the new leader. And they have a time of consecration there and prayer, and they get, uh, make sure they're sanctified and there's no sin in the camp. And then you remember that they come to the Jordan River, uh, the entrance to the promised land, and God miraculously parts the Jordan River. And then they march on towards Jericho, which was a military stronghold of the day. And you know the story here in the, in the book of Joshua, how, how the, the people went around uh, the walls of the city of Jericho uh, once every day. And then on the seventh day, they went around seven times. Then they shouted and blew the trumpets and boom, you know, the walls fell down and, and a great victory was won. And now they're moving on in their conquest of the land that God had given to them. And the next opponent is a, not a big tough guy like Jericho, but a a small city uh, by the name of Ai. And so here the people come to Ai, and that's where we pick up our story in Joshua chapter 7. And if you'll look with me in verse number 1 of Joshua 7, the Bible says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, 
took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them about thirty and six men, and they chased them for be, before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the heart of the people melted and became as water. So we find that here they've had this transition of leadership and, and clearly God's blessing and power upon Joshua during a time of consecration and then seeing the Jordan River parted and walking across on dry land and then, and then seeing the power of God where the walls of the, the, one of the strongest cities in the area uh, collapsed and we are not told in Joshua that there were any fatalities at all that they took one of the strongest cities in the whole promised land and, and no one died. Isn't it great when God does the fighting for you? <laughs> you know, it, it goes a lot better when, when God does the battling. And so um, they're on to their next little city of Ai and Joshua sends out spies. Now you remember the last time that the Bible tells us that they sent out spies? The 12 spies, when, you know, Moses, when the first time they came to the promised land, you know, 10 were bad, that's the song go, 10 were bad and two were good. I, you know, I can't remember the whole song. Uh, and, and, and so somebody's, I, I don't know what it is. I wrote in my notes, what is it about Jewish spies? <laughs> you know, I guess they, they don't do very well because here these spies come back and they, they give Joshua this counsel. They say, hey, you know, we took care of Jericho. We don't need everybody. Don't let all the people, don't make them all work. You know, let some of the guys sleep in for a little bit and, and just send a small force up because there's not AIs, this little town and, you know, no problem. And Joshua, you know, I don't, I, takes their, their counsel and the leaders do and they send out this group of 3,000 uh, an army of 3,000 men, and we know what happens. They, they lose. Now, we certainly can see in the storyline that Israel acts in pride as they overestimated their own strength and they underestimated the strength of their, their enemy. They, they overestimated their own wisdom by not seeking, you don't find any record here that they took any kind of time to pray about it, to think about it. And, and in so doing, I think that to some way they, they made a decision. So, you know, don't worry about this one, God. I got, I got this one figured out. We needed you at Jericho, but at AI, hey, we, we got this. You know, it's always very dangerous to forget God, isn't it? It's a dangerous thing. Yeah, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 9, and verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. In Psalm chapter 50, the psalmist said, Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. In other words, you know, if you don't got God on your side, worse yet, if you got God against you, you know, who are you going to call? Not Ghostbusters. You, you in trouble. And it's a dangerous thing as a, any nation that, that corporately forgets God, and certainly we could make that application today that unfortunately in many ways uh, our nation has forgot God and that, that, that culture battle is ongoing to, to this very day. But if you read the rest of the story, which I'm not going to take time to do this morning, many of you already know it, is Joshua, when they come back defeated, Joshua gets on his face before God and he starts praying this magnanimous prayer and, and God pre pretty much comes to him and says, hey Joshua, what are you doing on your face? Get up. You know, this isn't something you necessarily you need to pray about. And what I found interesting is that when Joshua is pretty much saying, God, why did we lose? You can read the text, but God nowhere in there says, well, because you sent spies in and they, they came back out and gave bad recommendation. It never says that God ever says to them, well, you didn't really seek, you know, you didn't pray about it first. God doesn't say to them, well, you should have brought more men, the 3,000 were a problem. Now, I don't know if that means that, that what they did was just utilizing their brain and God was okay with it. That, that really, we don't know. Because what we do know is why they lost. 
God is pretty clear with them. He doesn't talk about any of these other decisions. He comes back to one thing. And he says, you lost because Israel has taken of the accursed thing. Now you remember when they came to Jericho, this big city with lots of wealth in it, that God had told them, when you come into the, the promised land, the first city that you take, everything in there belongs to me. A, a, a picture of everything that God gives to us, the first portion should always belong to God. And basically God said, I'm going to take, you know, New York City and, you know, you can have slap out Alabama. And there's something to be said in remembering that even with the tangible gifts that God gives us, that God has always, Old Testament, New Testament, had this principle of recognizing that everything we have ultimately is given to us by God and we, we demonstrate that faith and that truth by giving back to him that which he asks, as the New Testament says, as God hath prospered us each week. And so they forgot God, but the bigger problem was they had violated the agreement. God said, don't touch anything and don't take any of the spoils of the first victory. It all belongs to me. And, and we know, that as you read in the rest of the story, that, that, that Joshua then begins an investigation. You know, I guess he had a blue ribbon panel, as they call them in Washington, D.C. And he started sorting out and seeking God's direction until they got to the right tribe and then right to the right family. And finally, God reveals an Achan, a man named Achan, is called out as the guilty party and in chapter 7, in verse 21, later in the chapter, Achan is, is, is talking to Joshua and says this. He says, when I saw the, among the spoils of, of Jericho a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So as a result of one man's decision... One man's sin, a, a, a sin of lust, of covetousness, of jealousy, of greed, and ultimately of pride, we read in our story this morning that 36 men are now dead. You know, I thought to myself, and, and I like history, and um, how many wars have been fought because of the sin and the pride and the greed and the jealousy of one person or a few? Many. You know, sin, just always a root cause, and sin, there's always a consequence to it. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of reproaching going on around the world, isn't there? Woo! Now, I don't want to get too far off. You know, last week I got, I stepped on too many toes last week. I didn't get banned by Facebook, though. That was kind of surprising. Um, but certainly I could begin to list the sins of the United States, which are many, and I would begin nationally, a national sin. I would begin with the sin of the slaughter of millions of unborn babies. And worse yet, we've turned, you know, and you don't believe me, Project Veritas, look at the videos, where we're turning abortion mills not only into the profit by killing babies, but then selling off their body parts. And yet somehow we think, well, we're not like those Old Testament Moabites and the Amorites and all those evil. Yeah, we're like the ites. And then I would put in there that we're flaunting sexual sin in the face of God, that he also very clearly from Genesis chapter 1 and throughout all the scripture is very clear on what he takes the sanct the sanctity of the sexuality of how we created man and woman inside the context of marriage. And we're violating both of those things, which is having devastating consequences on our families. We have more young people with problems today than ever, and we wonder why. And I think we can put the problem, much of it, right there. We've destroyed the marriage, the, the unique relationship between a man and a woman, and we've taken it, instead of sanctifying it, making it, when I say sanctified, I don't want, don't get all churchy on me. It means separated, that it's a special thing. It's a holy thing. In, instead, we've made it profane, i.e. we've made it common. You know, I, I, I know I'm going to be an old fuddy-duddy and I'm an old guy, but I got to tell you, the, the, the stuff, the information that comes on on commercials, 
let alone what's going on in primetime television, the topics and the innuendo. I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old. You know, a few decades ago in this country, that would have never been allowed on air. And if, if, if what we see in some commercials today would have been broadcast when I was a teenager, there would have been an uproar. And not just from the, the Christian right. There were some standards of decency and they're gone. And as a nation, we keep thinking we can flaunt our, our sin before a holy God and, and, and get away with it. And we're not getting away with it. We're less happy as a nation than we've ever been. And it, it, there's a heavy price. And for this picture we find here in Joshua chapter 7, they paid a price too. See, the Old Testament, as Dr. Frutenbaum would say, it, it, it doesn't define doctrine, but it illustrates doctrine. In other words, like he, Dr. Frutenbaum would say, you know, you, you can't, when you read an Old Testament story, like when Moses went to the Red Sea and took his rod and, you know, the Red Sea parted, you know, if you get a million Jews by the Red Sea and you get the, the religious leader of the day to get a staff and staff poke it in the ground, you can pray all you want to pray, but I doubt very much that that, because it happened in the Old Testament, means it's going to happen if we did it next week. Do you follow me? But we see in the deliverance of throughout of Egypt, we see the, 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 the Passover and we see the picture it is of salvation and by the blood, the, the covering of the blood that we can be delivered and pictured in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So here in Joshua 7, in this battle, we see the picture of, of spiritual warfare today and the promised land being a picture, not of heaven, but a picture of the victorious Christian life and that, 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 that you and I are involved in that warfare today. And in the New Testament, it, it's about the local church and and Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I got to tell you that the, the church that's doing what it ought to do ought to be doing battle right in front of the gates of hell. And that's, by the way, why a church like ours is involved in our local crisis pregnancy center. We don't just say, well, hey, we're happy for you or whatever. And it's amazing to me to go down there and talk to their leaders and find out that many churches in our own area won't even talk to them, let alone actually put real dollars behind it. And so the problem this morning with our country, I'm not going to lay most of the problem at, at Planned Parenthood's door, although they are a problem. The, the problem of America today is mostly found inside the churches. If American Christians would actually stand up and speak out and, boy, we could see, and vote. You know, now they want to do mail-in voting, you know. Ugh. If you can't get your backside out of, out of bed or wherever you are to go vote, then it's not that important to you, in my humble opinion. But, all right, I'm digressing. The bottom line is, in spiritual warfare today, we are struggling to bring up our families and we've realized in our experience in the destructive power of sin because we, we've committed sin before God and it impacts others. And, and, and individually, as a Christian, you know, don't discount the choices you make. You know, Satan, one of the great lies that he sells to us is that, hey, I, I can go ahead and I can do this, and it, it really won't affect anybody else, you know? I mean, we told each other a long time that if, that if I get a divorce, it won't really impact the children. Now, divorce happens, and there's hope for that, and there's recovery. My point is not to pick on divorced people. Matter of fact, here, we, we try to be a, a help, but don't believe the lie that your children aren't going to have an additional issues to, to, to go through. You know, Paul wrote, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7, the church of Corinth was having a, someone inside the church, a, a, a very in, incestuous, immoral activity was going on with some of the members of the church, and Paul wrote and said, you got to deal with it. you got to call it out. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, in that context, he says, purge out the old leaven or sin that ye may be a new lump as ye are in leaven, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. He goes on to say, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In other words, Paul tells that church, if, if you have gross immorality and you're aware of it, there's consequences coming, you've got to deal with it. And I've got to tell you, one of the great mysteries to me, and if you've lived for the Lord any length of time, unfortunately, many folks in my position, um, you, you know, they, they can have a TV ministry and they can be all powerful and, you know, they are, they'll be up there and they'll tell everybody how to live. And then you find out after the fact that, that this, 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 this 
preacher, this pastor, whoever they are, uh, has been having an, an affair relationship with somebody in the church for years. You know, be sure your sin will find you out. But when it's there, we got to deal with it. So each of us has to remember that the choices we make, it's just not about you. When we let our pride and our self-pity, our greed, our jealousy, it, it has an impact on somebody else. And many times, you know, I know, you know, you, there's a lot of responsibility in being an ambassador of Christ. And Christians today take it so lightly, but some folks, they'll, they'll hear about the local pastor, and we've had them in our area, and you know, if you know anything about our church, I'm, the church, I tell everybody right up front, I'm having, a, I'm having an ongoing affair with the church secretary, and, um, you know, I, I, I just, I just, we're public about it here, you know, the, the, the church secretary is my wife, okay? And I'll tell you, it's unfortunate when a husband or a wife will spend more energy and appeal to somebody else who's not their spouse. Why don't we put that energy into our marriages? Never stop dating your spouse. That's, that's, that wasn't even in my notes. That was just free. But because of things like that, there are many people today that say because of they've seen sin in the lives of leaders or other people that have, that have had consequences on them. And they're no longer serving God. And they're out of the fight. They're spiritually, if you will, dead. I'm not saying they're necessarily unsaved. I'm saying that in practical purposes, because they've been offended, they've been tripped up. Now, I always want to balance this. I understand that the actions I have and the actions you have have consequences and other people are influenced by them. They are. However, if you're listening this morning and that's you and somebody has let you down, can I, I'm going to give you a free word of advice that, that when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, but now you're not serving God because somebody failed you. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was some spiritual leader. I don't know who it was. But at some point in time, you're going to look the Lord Jesus Christ in the eyes and saying because what somebody else did ain't going to cut it. In, in, in the book of James, James says in James chapter 1, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with either, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, you choose uh, sin in your life or you choose to disobey what God calls you to do, then, then there's, a, there's a price to that. That's why James goes on and encourages these believers, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Each of us has a responsibility before God. See, at the end of the day, when I read this passage, and we're going to show a video here in a little bit, um, there really was one thing that when I read this, because most of you have read this story, know a little bit about it, but how many, I'm not asking for a show of hands, remembered there were 36 guys who died. 36 men. 36 men, think about these 36. They simply did their duty. They followed orders. We have a lot of military personnel active and retired in our church that understand this responsibility of doing your duty. These 36 men were among the 3,000 that all of them willingly risked their lives that others, their families, and that their nation and in obedience to the, to the call of God would, would live and move forward. And yet 36 of them are dead. And sometimes you read a number and you read a statistic and it's just a number and it's just a statistic. But I want you to consider that these 36 men never went back home, except maybe in a box. 36 men. Now, maybe some of them were young men. Maybe some of these young guys that were young men that went out to war, they, they never were going to have the opportunity to marry their high school sweetheart. They were never going to have the, 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 the opportunity to pursue a life goal of some passion that, that they had. They, they never were going to have the joy of children or, or even greater joy of grandchildren. Life for them was gone. 36 men. All these, men's, all these men were sons of somebody. 36 sons that were never coming home to a loving mom. And 
having military service in my family, and many of us here know the, the pressure, the fear, the worry that, in, that surrounds a, a mother when she has a son who's deployed. 36 men, maybe some of them were fathers. Fathers that maybe had small children or maybe they had teenagers, but these children would never see their father again. 36 men, maybe some of them who were married, who had a loving wife who that morning had sent her husband away with the fear and the worry and the prayers and, 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 and was trusting God for the deliverance of their loved one. And they, when the, the, the men came running back, and I, I can see in my mind that the, the wives and the families were waiting at the edge of the camp. And as the different men came in and they, they went to the different parts of the camp where their tribe was located and then they found their family unit, that, that, that 36 of these families, their loved one didn't come back. You see, if you do the math, and I'm not really good at math, so somebody, Oscar, you might want to check my numbers, but 2,964 men did come back. But for 36 families, life was never going to be the same. And for the rest of their lives, that family that lost that son or father or husband, the name of the city Ai would always pierce their heart with sorrows. You see, these 2,964 men and their families, they came home and their lives moved forward, which has to happen. And we know the rest of the story that they got the problem cleared up and they did some military strategy and, you know, and, and the battle was won. The rest of the men and for the nation, life went on. Their lives went on. The 36 men did not, and their families were impacted for the rest of their lives. You see, today, as Americans, we are celebrating Memorial Day, and it's a holiday we have as Americans to specifically remember those that paid the ultimate price that gave their lives for the foundation, the creation of this country, and then for its preservation. And some men, we go back to the Revolutionary War, gave their lives at a place called Bunker Hill, or maybe in the Civil War, men on both sides that gave their lives at places like Bull Run, or in World War I in the eastern part of France, or World War II in Normandy, or in Okinawa, or men that and women that paid for the price of freedom in Korea or in Vietnam or in Iraq or Afghanistan. Many died and we live. You see, war is life and death. I know war gets romanticized by the movie industry many times and you know, we have the Rambo, you know. We've got several of those Rambos here at our church, so don't cause problems at our church. It's dangerous. But war is the worst of mankind. Even when it's fought for the most noblest of reasons, it still is a display of the depravity of man. And I am thankful that I personally have never been in that position that others have always served in in my place and in my stead but again as i mentioned i have and do have combat service in our family and as a pastor here in a military town have spent significant time with those that have been in some of those situations and i can tell you that the men that even come back they're never quite the same Part of them dies in a way. And yet the rest of us, we, we live. We have our picnic. We're more concerned about our drive through order. And sometimes I think as Americans, it's, we have this holiday for us to stop and remember. They died and we live. 
And just like our story, these 36 men just did their duty and they followed orders. And how were they to know that they had really been sold out? That basically they had lost their air support, if you will. They had lost their artillery. And they didn't know it. They didn't know that they'd been given bad orders. Bad strategy. And yet on they went. And how many men in some of our wars that were less than led correctly just did their duty. When I say that, they did it to the point that they gave their life. You see, I want you and me to be reminded today that they died and you live. I live. They gave us the gift of life and as Americans, the gift of great opportunity. What are you doing with it? You know, nothing bothers me more than when I see people that have no ambition, get themselves in areas of addictions and bondages, and they, they have this life that they could do whatever you want. And they do nothing. I think that's disrespectful to the guys that gave everything for you to have the opportunity. Now, he, they gave you the opportunity to do nothing and waste it, and I guess that's what you can do, and some do. And then today, are we selling out our freedom? You know, some folks won't take any kind of heat at all, aren't willing to stand up and tell their elected representatives, no, you can't tell us our churches are non-essential. No, you can't violate the Constitution. And then as Christians, may we never forget that our sin, my sin, our sin led to the death of the righteous one, the Son of God. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That because of my failure, he went on to war and paid the price and died on a cross. But thanks be to God that he is God and three days later he rose again and now he can offer you victory over the greatest war you'll ever have, which is the war over sin and death. And through simple faith in him, the Bible says you can have eternity in heaven with God. Do you know him as your personal savior today? But dear Christian, in, spite, in light of that gift that we've been given, the price for victory was high. As Peter wrote, we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the war, the spiritual war, there are casualties. And we are involved in a great struggle, those of us who are people of faith. If you believe that every person you see has an eternal soul, that soul's on its way to heaven or hell, are we willing to get involved in the battle? I'm thankful as an American that some gave all. And as a Christian, there were Christian martyrs that went on before me, beginning with the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles and throughout church history, that I could know the truth of eternal life. War is about life and death. He died, we live. They died, and we live. You know, I was... Um, I always try to find a special um, video to show on these days and we're about to transition to a video and then we'll be done this morning. And so I, I was doing research on that and I'm always looking around and I find them months ahead of time, ones that I want to use. And I found this video and what attracted me was the organization. Um, it's called uh, uh, Memoirs of World War II. Uh, and on uh, your Facebook, there'll be, a, there'll be a link in this video, Stephen, I want you to show it all the way to the end where they do their little promo about the, the organization because I don't ever want to show stuff without copyright, pray that we don't get taken down because I contacted the organization and emailed with the, the director, a man by the name of Joshua Scott. You'll see him on this video at the end. And um, what they do is try to preserve the, the stories of our World War II vets. There's only 3% of them left. And by the way, we have one here. Now, he's not here today because of the virus issue, but y'all know Brother Don, and he's a, he's a treasure. He, he really is. Um, 
And today I want to introduce you in this video to a man by the name of Theo Estridge and one of his best buddies that he went through, Marine Boot Camp. We're going to look at Marines today. Where's my Marines? There we go. All right. There we go. A couple of them. Um, his friend's name is, um, oh, what's his friend's name? Norton Larson. And these two men went through basic training together and they go to war in Okinawa, in the Battle of Okinawa. And war, one lives, one dies. But what was amazing about this video that I want to share with you as I watched it, and I was like, this is it. I knew when I was watching it, this is the video I want to show. It's 12 minutes long, so it's a little longer than I normally would show, but it's Memorial Day, and I thought it was worth it. But at the very end of this, this, this guy, Theo Estridge, is from Indiana. And I know we got some Indiana people here, right? We got Indiana people here. And I know I've got, Jen and I used to live in Indiana, and um, just south of the town we lived in, which was Richmond, Indiana, and we went to uh, Hillcrest Baptist Church and uh, Pastor Holman, and, and for a long time there, his son, Marty Holman, was a pastor, and also his other son, Mike Holman, was an assistant pastor there. And then Mike Holman, who's a dear friend of mine, pastors a church in a little town south of Richmond called Brookville, Indiana. Rock, you've been there, right? You've been there? No? Um, many times, that's right. This guy came back after the war and ended up, he's from Brookville, Indiana. And there's a church in this video that you'll see in the background in the, some of the pictures he'll talk about. And that church is pastored by a very dear friend of mine. Small world, isn't it? So let's remember as I close, as we close this morning, war is life and war is death. And we want to pay uh, 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 respect to our, our veterans. By the way, one more thing. Sorry, Stephen, I forgot my pictures. I got to do it. I got to do it. Oh, Stephen's got a picture up here. I don't know if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. I've not actually been there. But as I thought about this message this morning about some live and some die, I think this is the one. This is the Vietnam Memorial. And Stephen was telling me he's been there. Right? You've been there? Oh, the Korean War. All right, then I don't want to lie. All right, Stephen, Stephen gave me bad information. You know, I should have gotten it from Aerie. I'd have been better off. But... Thanks, Stephen. Th this is uh, the, from the Vietnam uh, War Memorial. And if you've ever been there, you know that it's most noted for the next picture, the wall. And it's interesting because on this wall is etched the names of every man and woman that gave their life for our country during the Vietnam War. And do you know how many names are on that wall? I know you don't. If you do, you're really good. Stephen does now. I asked him. <laughs> All right, what's the number, Stephen? That's right. You cheated. <laughs> 58,276 names. Let that sink in. 58,276 names. Wow. Every single one of those names is a family, is a life. They died that we could live. All right, here's, here's Theo Estridge and uh, Norton Larson. I hope you enjoy that. We'll watch this video and we'll, we'll close in prayer. Go ahead, guys, get the lights. And General Buckner came on the intercom to all the troops. Men were about ready to invade the Alamo of Okinawa. He said, I want you to know you're not only fighting for your country, but you're fighting for your loved ones back home. And that really comforted me because I told some of my friends, I said, I think I'll be the first one killed. Sunday afternoon, about two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm walking down the main street in the hometown, and a car came by, and the radio was blasting, we're at war. The Japs had bombed Pearl Harbor. I was 15 years old at the time. When I heard all the casualties at the Pearl Harbor, it made me want to go in the war. Shortly after graduating high school, Ted Estridge was drafted into the United States Marines. 
The next few months saw him going through basic training and joining up with the 1st Marine Division. They sent me to San Diego, California. I went through boot camp there. Then we went to uh, Camp Pendleton. That's where we had advanced training. The 1st Marine Division was in Pumubu, Solomon Islands. They just finished the campaign in Pepelu. Prior to Ted's arrival, the 1st Marine Division had already endured what was to them hell on earth, seeing intense combat at Guadalcanal, New Britain, and Peleliu. Each campaign dragged on far longer than anticipated, costing the 1st Division nearly 10,000 casualties. But now, with Ted among their ranks, the next objective would be the Division's deadliest campaign yet. First day of April, April Fool's Day. They started early in the morning, battleships sailing the island. Then General Buckner, he came on the intercom to all the troops. Men were about ready to invade the island of Okinawa. He said, I want you to know you don't even fight for your country. You're fighting for your loved ones back home. And that really comforted me because I told some of my friends, I said, I think I'll be the first one killed. When we landed, the army went south and the Marines went north. I tell you, war is a terrible thing. Kill or be killed. The Japanese had the whole island mapped out. They had tunnels where they could escape, go back to the next hill. Artillery. They knew where to place the artillery. And you hear the shells coming, screaming person, debris would fall all over you. General Buckner, he was killed in the Battle of Okinawa. On the 18th of June, as Lieutenant General Simon Buckner observed the battle from a few hundred yards behind the front lines, he was hit by shrapnel from a Japanese artillery shell. This is the last known photo of the general, taken only moments before his death. For the 1st Marine Division, the Battle of Okinawa was a painstaking process of eliminating an enemy who was firmly entrenched in a series of heavily fortified hills. Casualties continued to mount, and Ted would be one of them. We were taking a hill. We were two-thirds away up the hill and the mortar round came in. Hit me right in the shoulder. It's almost like a sledgehammer. And uh, I fell down to the ground and my buddy in front of me, uh, Gordon Larson, the same shell got me. He had a piece of shrapnel that came underneath his nose, came out the back of his head killed him instantly. And that could have been me. Why me, Lord? That's what I thought. Then my buddy helped me pick me up, and we went on and back to where we embarked from. At that time, there was all wounded laying all over the place. Then the next morning, the hospital ship came in close to shore as we did. They had a cable run from the land to the, the hospital ship. And they put me on a, snapped me on that cable. And that afternoon, there was a nurse over the hospital ship 
window. And she screamed, oh, he's going to hit us. It's a suicide plane. I was aiming at us, not but a destroyer anchored next to the hospital ship and hit the destroyer. Immediately, they started bringing in sailors, burned terribly. In fact, I was in the middle of a boat, had a sailor at my foot, wanted a foot. Both of them died that night. Yeah, every morning they'd have a burial service on the hospital ship. When I was able to walk, I went and watched how they buried you did. They put an American flag over the body. They had a slide go down and right into the ocean. You know, the Bible says in the last resurrection, the seas you'll give up the dead. There's been thousands buried at sea. After nearly three months of gruesome combat, the Battle of Okinawa came to a close. With the island secure, the United States military now had a position from which they could launch a mainland attack on Japan. But the attack would never come. In August of 1945, two atomic bombs were dropped on the Japanese mainland. When they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, well, that was the beginning of the end. There have been millions killed if we had invaded Japan. I'm just thankful we didn't have to. Whenever I came back, I had points to get discharged, and uh, they took me to Great Lakes, Illinois. And I took a tr train from Chicago to Indianapolis, then rode a bus into Brookville, Indiana. When I arrived there, the streets were all empty. And the service station was open, and I went in there with one of my buddies before the war. I said, could you take me out of my house? So he drove out and parked in front of my father's house, blew the horn. My mother came to the door and said, who is it? I said, you don't know, do you? She screamed, said, it's Theo. They always called me Theo. And she ran out there and threw the arms around me. That was the happiest moment of my life. November 1958, the Lord called me into ministry. Called me to go back to Okinawa as a missionary. Now I tell you, I hated Okinawa, hated the Japanese people at the time, until the Lord saved me. And he gave me a love for the Japanese people in Okinawa. I told my family we spent 15 years on Okinawa as a missionary. Several years after the war's end, Ted found himself returning to Okinawa, this time with a different mission. The very place where he had seen the worst of mankind was now his home, and the people he had once considered enemies now were like family. Ted's new journey led him back to the very hill on Okinawa where he had been wounded. I could almost go to the exact spot. I got on my knees and I said, oh God, I thank you. Spare my life, right here. I say, why me, Lord? Lord Morrison couldn't have family, a wife, children, or grandchildren. About a few weeks ago, my granddaughter came to visit from North Carolina, and she put a little Nine month old, great grandson in my arms. Lord, you couldn't have experienced that. I know 
I know this. Anybody that's been in combat, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, it's just by the grace of God we we made it. The real heroes are those that gave their life for their country. Hi everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II and I just want to say thank you so much for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon and check out our website in the links below for more information. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. We want to say thank you for your support and thanks for watching. Would you pray with me, please, Lord? Thank you so much for the teaching of your word today and just the thank you for just the grace of being born as Americans and enjoying the freedom. And Lord, our country needs a revival in a way that it has not in a long, long time when we recognize we are involved in a great, great struggle, a great spiritual warfare. Lord, I pray that if there's any listening to the sound of my voice that's unsure that they're on their way to heaven, they've never received the the free gift, the victory that you've provided through your finished work and your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Lord, I pray that they would, at this very moment, choose to believe, choose to receive that gift. But Lord, I pray for Christians today. Lord, help us to be reminded that every one of us matters. Each of us are to be involved in this spiritual warfare and uh, doing our part and influencing folks for your kingdom. And, and as Americans, Lord, help us to, uh, to, to be a, the, the salt and the light in this land. Lord, I'm so thankful for, um, again, uh, the, the gift of, of freedom. And uh, Lord, I pray that as we celebrate this weekend through enjoying family and, uh, and maybe a nice meal, that, uh, that we would be mindful of those, uh, of our fellow Americans that paid the ultimate price to secure our freedom. Lord, again, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the folks that are here and those listening online, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for tuning in today and being part of our church service. We, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, we pray that you'll join again on Wednesday night with us at 7 o'clock. Uh, youth group will be at Pastor Cody's house again at 7, uh, or you can zoom in on that and uh, see him if you have any questions. But uh, thank you very much. Happy Memorial Day again. If uh, We'd love to see you here. If we don't see you here, we will see you there. Jump up.